The doctors in the emergency department thought they'd seen everything. But they weren't expecting this. No one was expecting this. In Liverpool, at Alderhay Accident and Emergency, is 15-year-old Ollie. Oh, he looks a bit sheepish. Yeah, well, look what he's done. Uh, is that a staple? Yep. I can't move it, like, straighten or anything. Well, just wait till you hear how he did it. Ollie was in his history lesson at school doing some research. Oh, great. Let's learn about Spartacus. Nice outfit. I know you love the Romans, Aunt, but no, it was 1920s America. Ooh, exciting. Is he dancing with Charleston? Uh, actually, Ollie had got distracted at the time. Oh, so what was he doing? He was busy stapling sheets into his exercise book when his stapler broke. OK, Chris, where's this story going? Well, while he was trying to fix his stapler, he pulled back the spring and stapled his own finger. Ouch! The teacher had a look and everyone burst out laughing. That's just mean. Well, here to have a serious look at that damaged digit is Dr Bimmel Mehta. Hi, Oliver. I'm Bimmel. I'm one of the a &E doctors. How are you, mate? What's happened? Staple. Right, staple. How have you done that? Uh, I was trying to fix it and I, I forgot my finger was under it, so I pressed it in. Doesn't look like there's very much bleeding around it. Nope. Dr Bimmel checks the sensation in Ollie's finger to see if he's damaged any of his nerves. Can you feel me touching you there? Mm, yeah, slightly. Yeah, does it feel the same as it does on that side? Feels a bit more like solid there, but okay. So, what's the verdict on that staple, Doc? We're just gonna do some x rays, see where it is in his finger, and then decide what we're going to need to do with it. If it's gone into his bone, then that will need to come out uh, maybe with an operation and a clean, but if it's just missed, it, missed his bone, then we should be able to pull it out in the department. Ollie's starting to look a little bit nervous now, but it's important that staple comes out, otherwise, it could cause an infection. Like other parts of the body, bones can get infected. Bone infection occurs when bad bacteria spread to the bone from an open cut or wound on nearby skin, or from other parts of the body through the bloodstream. Next, Ollie needs an X-ray. I, I can't straighten that. Ah, we won't ask you to straighten it. Ooh, that is a bit bendy. Brilliant, that's fine. All done. Jill, the radiographer, is impressed. That's, yeah, that's a pretty good injury, to be honest. It certainly is. Find out later if Ollie needs an operation to patch up that painful pinky. Ready to see some amazing experiments? Yes! A triumph! We're going to show you how your incredible body works. Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today, the hero of breathing, your diaphragm. What is going on? Lucy, meet Dr Chris. Dr Chris, meet Lucy. Zond, I know who Lucy is. We've already met. Have you? Yes. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Chris. I saw her on The Voice and it was me who asked her to come in. Was it? Yes. I thought Lucy could help us demonstrate the power of the diaphragm. Oh, right. Now, Lucy, could you give us another long note, please? Now, Lucy and other opera singers can hold a note this long because she's trained a special muscle, one which we all have, called the diaphragm. Now, your diaphragm sits here at the bottom of your rib cage. Thank you. Let's find out what the diaphragm looks like and how it works. Lucy? We're going to show... Thanks, Lucy. Your diaphragm is the main muscle you use when you breathe, which is something we all do all the time. Now, to show you what a diaphragm looks like, we've got a real one from a pig. Now, this is the pig's voice box. This is the trachea, or the windpipe. These bits are the lungs, and then underneath the lungs, in a big, muscular sheet, that is the diaphragm. You breathe in and out about 20 to 30,000 times a day. And it's this, the diaphragm, that makes it all happen. So after your heart, it's the most important muscle in your body because it allows you to breathe. Now take a breath. Most people have no idea why the air moves into their lungs. Well, we're going to show you. Take this away, Chris. I've got a model. 
Now, the big bottle is your rib cage, and these things inside represent your lungs. Sand, those aren't lungs, those are my party balloons. We're using them for a very important scientific demonstration. OK, well, I suppose if it's in the service of science. Good. And this at the bottom is your diaphragm. Now, we tend to think that breathing is all about the lungs, but the diaphragm is the unsung hero of breathing. It's what makes it all happen, and that's why the diaphragm is such an important muscle. Now, when you breathe in, the diaphragm pulls downwards. This lowers the pressure inside this chest cavity. This creates extra space, a vacuum, and air has no option but to rush in through your mouth and into your lungs to fill this space. And then you breathe out again. Your lungs really are a bit like these balloons. They have no muscles at all. They're just like bags, really, and they don't do anything without the diaphragm. It's pretty amazing. And to show you what your diaphragm looks like in action inside your body, here's mine. These big black areas are my lungs, or party balloons. The pulsating bit in the middle is my heart, and down at the bottom, this is my diaphragm. Now, what you can see is my diaphragm here is contracted, and now it's relaxing, and as it relaxes, it rises up and forces air out of my lungs. As you then breathe in, the diaphragm contracts again, and just like the pink balloons, the lungs fill with air. That is incredible. So, we've shown you that your diaphragm is the real hero of breathing. It's one of the most important muscles in the body, enabling you to take about 30,000 breaths a day. Chris, I really want to sing now, can I? OK, Zand, since you love it so much, but hold on just one second. OK, Zand. Mi piace bello. If you have a medical emergency, there are teams of paramedics on standby 24-7, ready to leap into action. We're on call with the UK Emergency Services, showing you what it's really like on the front line saving lives. On call with me is paramedic Jan Van. She's got all the kit she needs when she turns up and is the first responder at the scene of an emergency. Right, Jan, let me give you a help with that kit. Come on, let's go. Uh, Chris? Honestly, Chris. A new case is just in. So we've just got a call to an eight-year-old boy who's fallen off a zip line in a playground and banged his head on a metal pole. So this is potentially a really serious injury. So he's got to get there quickly and make sure he's OK. So we rush to the scene. You guys call the ambulance. Jan's quickly attending to the patient. Any pain while touching your neck, darling? No. no. As it's a head injury, Jan needs to check for spinal injuries and any other trauma. Can you move your legs for me? Wiggle on. Oh, Lift them up. Me a minute, go. That's it. And the other one? Fantastic. He seems fine. Now for the wound itself. Right, let's have really? a look. He's got quite a nasty gash around his eye. You'll have a little scar. All the girls will think you're a superhero. Hey, so do you remember hitting your head? Yeah. That's a really good sign. Everything seems fine at the moment, apart from that cut. Dad carries him over to the ambulance. Joshua's going to be going to hospital with the ambulance crew and potentially having some stitches on top of his head. So, Josh, how are you feeling now? OK. You feel like you're in good hands here in the ambulance? Yeah. Josh is one tough little boy. Banged his head really hard. But you know what the really good thing here is? that he remembers hitting his head. He didn't go unconscious. So his head injury is less likely to be serious. And next time, he'll be a bit more careful on the zip line. Still to come, we sozzle your senses. <laughs> the Ouchmobile is open. Next patient, please. And I turn detective. I've got everything I need to solve this mystery once and for all. Earlier, we met Ollie and his stapled finger. Let's see if his condition is still staple. No, no, wait. Let's see if the doctors have managed to stapleize his condition. Let's see if he's managing to hold it all. Zan, that's enough. Back in Liverpool, Ollie is in hospital after accidentally stapling his finger. I can't move it. 
like straightener or anything. Ollie was in his history lesson at school. He was busy stapling sheets into his exercise book when his stapler broke. While he was trying to fix it, he pulled back the spring and stapled his own finger. Earlier, Ollie had some x-rays of his painful pointer. There's the staple. Has it gone into the bone? Over to Dr Bimmel to find out. That's your finger, but we've got another view. So we Is it just it. missed? Yeah. So it's not sticking in your bone. Great news. I think we will just uh, grab it and pull it out. OK. All right, happy with that? Yeah. So Ollie must be pleased there's no need for an operation. But that staple still needs to come out, and he's looking a little bit nervous. I wonder if we'll, like, pluck it out really quickly. I think that'll hurt when it gets pulled out. Dr Bimmel is back. Right, Ollie, are we ready to get that staple out? Three, two, one. Oh, well, that was very easy. What a pro, dog. I could have done that. <laughs> Do you want to keep the staple as a memento? <laughs> no, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. You can't even see where the staple was. That was so anticlimactic. <laughs> it was a bit, Ollie. So we just pulled the staple out and there wasn't any signs of any uh, big injury, so Ollie can go home now and we wouldn't expect any other problems with it. And uh, have you learned any lessons, Ollie? Yeah. If you, if you see a broken stapler, don't try and fix it. It doesn't end well. Good advice. Bye! Bye. Now we're going to mess with your mind. Weird. Scramble your senses. And baffle your brain. In Mindbenders! Today's mind-bending trick is all about distraction. If you're sufficiently distracted, you might not notice something that's going on right in front of your eyes. That's not how it works, aunt. Who said that? Today, the children at this school think they're here to learn about bones, but we've got a trick up our sleeve. See if you can spot it. I want you to count all the bones that you can see in this picture. Go. And the first team get right on it, before we've even had time to arrange the scenery. And stop. OK, how'd you do? I went to 49. You got 49, Mohammed? 52. 52. 47. 47. Um, 48. 48. Well, they were all pretty close, but did anyone notice something strange? Let's have another look. Right there, Zand was replaced by a fake Zand, and nobody noticed. How far can we push this? We give the group another task. Starting now. Count all the bones in that picture. And at the same time, swap fake Zand with Mr Hoskins, their teacher. Somebody they should definitely recognise. OK, look at me. Answers. Three. But amazingly, still nobody notices. I now want you to count the back bones. Go. Now we get extreme. I'm going to swap places with Chris. There's that scenery coming through again. And right there, Sand and I swap over. And time's up. OK. Now, when you were counting, did you notice anything else? Maybe not on the board. <gasps> ah! Finally, they've spotted it. Oh, Mr. Hoskins. And all our groups fell for it. Oh. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> you are, you are, you are him. <laughs> I didn't notice anyone. You didn't notice at all? No. <laughs> Have you ever seen this man before? No. Really, because he was standing right in front of you a few minutes ago. Dr. Chris? That worked pretty well. I'm so confused. <laughs> Why do you think it worked? How are we able to fool you so easily? Well, we were so focused. Like, we didn't... We weren't aware what's happening around us. Iman's exactly right. When your brain's concentrating on one thing really hard, it tunes out everything else that's going on around you, even so that you'll miss something quite important that's happening right in front of your eyes. Stop that! Now, did you know you have the most hairs on your head when you're about 16? This gets less as you get older, but don't worry, you've got plenty, with around 100,000 of them on your bonds. <laughs> We're at a theme park to solve your medical mysteries. 
Zond is preparing the Alchmobile ready for his first patient. And Chris is out and about in the park to answer your burning questions. Wow, I'm impressed. At the clinic, Zond is open for business. Can I have the next patient, please? First in is eight-year-old Liam, whose scalp needs some studying. So, Liam, what's brought you to the Alchmobile? I have a double crown. I want to know a little bit about it. What's the diagnosis, Doc? Sounds to me like a case of I've got a double crown and I want to know a little bit about it. Itis. That's right. Now, tell me about these double crowns. Where are they? Here on my head. On the top of your head. Well, I want to get a closer look. Can you lift the eyelid for the ouch cam? That's great. So everyone has one crown at least. That's the bit at the back of your head where the hair kind of whirls in a circle. But in Liam's case, he's got two. And that is very unusual. What is a crown? A crown is nature's way of covering your head with hair very effectively. Your hair's also got to change direction, so hair's got to go down at the back, down at the front, down at the sides. And the only efficient way of doing that is to swirl it round in a circle. All having a double crown means is that you're a bit special and a bit unusual. Very few people have them. I've never seen one before. So thanks very much for bringing your amazing head into the Alchmobile. And thank you, Dr. Zan. Away from the clinic, Chris is out and about in the park. How can we be twins but be so different? So how are you guys different? She's got Down syndrome and I don't. And you don't? OK. Zand and I come from one egg, whereas you each come from a different egg in your mum. And Down syndrome happens when the egg that made Charlotte had one extra chromosome in it. So in every egg, the chromosomes, the chromosomes are the genes, and Charlotte's got one more chromosome than you. That means you look a little bit different, and I guess you feel a bit different, and you may act a little bit different, you may think a little bit differently. So what things do you like to do that you're good at? Dancing. Dancing. So like all twins, you've probably got lots of things that you like that are the same. Yeah. And so the one difference is you've got an extra chromosome. Yeah. Back at the Alchmobile, there's a new case in the waiting room. Next patient, please. And it's 10-year-old Josiah who wants Zahn to check out his cheek. So, Josiah, why have you come to the Alchmobile? Well, I have a scar running from my eye to my mouth. So what's the diagnosis, Doc? Sounds like a case of I've got a scar running from my eye to my mouth itis. Sounds right to me. Now, how did it happen? Well, I grabbed something from my brother and he jumped and scratched me in my face. Now, Josiah, can we get a closer look at this scar of yours? Yeah. Can you open the eyelid for the ouch can? I'm going to zoom in here. And that's it there. Now, have you got any questions about your scar? If I go older, would my scar get bigger? You're already 10 years old. So your head is about 95% as big as it's ever going to be. So if you look at our heads, our heads are actually quite similar size, right? They're roughly the same size. That means that the skin on your face isn't going to change size, and so that scar is going to stay roughly the same size. What did it look like when you first got it? It looked like this. Oh, wow. Scars just take a long time to heal, so that'll keep healing over time, and in a few years, I bet you won't even be able to notice it. Josiah, thanks very much for bringing in your amazing scar. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dan. Job done for today. Clinic closed. <laughs> Two words. There's nothing like quality family time. You're being a doctor doing surgery. Chris and I love hanging out with our dad. You've hurt yourself. Playing games, having a laugh, enjoying each other's company. Surgery yell. It's Operation Ouch! <laughs> you two are terrible at charades. I'm going to go and get some strawberry milk. Mmm, I'm so looking forward to this. has happened to my strawberry milk? One of you two has drunk my strawberry milk. Well, it definitely wasn't me. It wasn't me. I never liked the stuff. Must be him. Looks like this is a case for an investigation <laughs> ouch. If I'm not mistaken, there should still be some saliva around the rim of this bottle, and saliva contains DNA, a special genetic code that's unique to absolutely everybody. So all we need to do is compare the DNA in the saliva here with each of us to find out who stole the milk. Step one in solving the mystery of my strawberry milk is to collect a sample of saliva from Dad, Chris and me. 
Now, with this and the strawberry milk bottle, I've got everything I need to solve this mystery once and for all. Your body is made of billions of cells, each with a different job to do. But how do they know what their job is? Well, that's where DNA comes in. You, eye colour. You, gender. You, hair colour. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's a molecule which contains the instructions for all living things, including everything from whether you're a male or a female to the colour of your skin. This is a DNA testing lab, the perfect place for me to get our DNA tested. And this is Emma. She's a DNA specialist. This is the DNA of a strawberry. Well, so that's real visible DNA. It is, yes. That's incredible. So how similar is that to my DNA? It's very similar. All living things share some of the same functionalities. Even with something like a banana, we share about 50% of our DNA with a banana. Hmm. Dr Chris is probably more like 60%. Oi! Emma is collecting the DNA from saliva on the strawberry milk bottle. She'll now analyse it along with our saliva and get the results. I'm going to catch Chris or Dad, and then they're going to be sorry. The DNA data on the top is from the bottle and is that of our thief. The DNA data on the bottom is from our samples. Whoever matches exactly is the culprit. First suspect in the dock is Dad. He's got something in common with the crime scene, but it's not a direct match. So, Dad's off the hook. Now for suspect number two, Dr Chris. So, here we can see that every region we're looking at is a direct match. Chris's DNA and the thief's DNA are exactly the same. I knew it. He's going down for this. I'm going to go and get him right now. Dr Zand? Gonna... What? There's something you probably want to see here. Which is? Um, this is your profile. And it's also a direct match for the crime scene. What? Oh, dear. How's that possible? It definitely wasn't me. Yourself and Dr Chris are identical twins. We've got the same DNA. That's right. Because identical twins have exactly the same DNA, the test can't tell the difference between innocent me and that criminal Chris. I still don't have the evidence I need to put Dr Chris behind bars. I'm going back to the scene of the crime to reinvestigate. Bad news, everybody. I'm afraid the lab results only rule out Dad. Chris, it's either you or me, but because we have the same DNA, we can't be sure which. I guess it's just one of those things that we'll never, ever, ever know. Ever. Sand, I think if you're getting one thing, fridge cam. Ooh, fridge cam! Yeah, and fridge cam has the answer to the mystery. Go on, then. Is that me? Well, this proves nothing. This doesn't look good. Well, case closed, I think, Zand. Rods, anyone? Ouch. Our next patient's day has taken an unexpected turn. Oh, I do like an unexpected turn. <clears throat> and they've ended up in A&E. In accident and emergency, five-year-old Ayushi has come in with a cut eyebrow. Oh, no! What happened? Picture the scene, Zand. A football stadium full of cheering fans. The crowd going nuts. Wow! Did I just spot a cashew? Zand, world-class football was being played on the pitch, and running up and down the touchline was Ayushi. Ooh! Is she a linesman? No, Zand. Ooh! Is she warming up to replace Harry Kane? No, Zand. She was chasing her friend Mohammed along the touchline when someone kicked the ball and it hit her on the head. Ouch! The question is, did she catch Mohammed? No, he was fast. Oh well, you can't win them all. Here to have a nose at Ayushi's noggin is Dr. Edward Snelson. Come on in, have a seat. But Ayushi's having far too much fun for that. The fact Ayushi is playing is a good sign, but the doctor needs to do further checks. So, can I have a look at the bump on your head? Can you close your eyes very tight for me? Oh. And then open them really wide. Don't go to sleep, Ayushi. Open your eyes. That's very good. Now, can you have a little look at my finger over there? And look at it up there, all the way over here. 
all the way there and down there. She seems completely well. I'm not concerned about her from a head injury point of view. Now, the cut is only the top part of the skin. It doesn't go all the way down. Okay. So because of that, it's almost certainly not going to need stitches. Your skin is made up of layers of skin cells, fat, tissue and blood cells. The deeper the cut, the more layers get damaged. Minor cuts only affect the top layer. That's what's happened to Ayushi's eyebrow. The skin needs to come back together so that it doesn't produce a nasty scar. So Ayushi's cut is treated by Nurse Becky. But it's not her wound that Ayushi is worried about. Is it a sticker? Who doesn't want a sticker? I do. A few steri strips later, and Ayushi is all patched up. There we go. Perfect. All stuck together. What do you say now? Thank you. That's no problem. Have we forgotten something? The sticker. I haven't forgotten your sticker. There we go. All stickered up and raring to go, Ayushi's off. Bye! <laughs> so we'll see you next time for more Operation Ouch! Operation Ouch! Operation Ouch.